there. I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Podcast. I'm really excited about my guest today, but before I get to the interview, I want to answer one of your questions. And at the end of this interview, I'll share with you how you can have your questions answered. This is a question from Becky. I have very sensitive skin and break out in acne all the time. I've heard about using oils to cleanse and moisturize my skin, but I'm worried it will make me break out even more. Are there any oils that are okay for acne prone skin? Well, Becky, that's a great question. A lot of people with acne prone skin or people that are concerned about breaking out think that you can't use oils on the skin, but it's really about using the right kind and pure kinds of oils and the right blend. So there are two that I'm going to mention. If you're doing a do-it-yourself skincare regimen or you're looking at natural skincare products and ingredients in those, there are two that I'm going to recommend that you keep an eye out for. That's almond oil and jojoba oil. Jojoba oil is one that you may not have heard of before. It's spelled J-O-J-O-B-A. And these are great oils for even acne prone skin or dry skin that works well too. But they're not going to be those poor clogging acne producing kinds of oils. In fact, they actually help nourish the skin. You don't want to dry and dry out and strip your skin, even if you tend to have oilier acne prone skin. So that's that's some um, some advice on oils. And speaking of oils, one of my favorite oils to consume internally for glowing skin comes from a food. That food is wild salmon. If you've heard me talk about the best foods for skin, you've probably heard me mention how great salmon is to eat for healthy skin because of its omega-3 and astaxanthin content. I've had people ask me a lot of questions about fish because I talk about salmon being such a great food. They ask me if it's safe to eat, if it's sustainable for the environment. So to answer your questions and tell you all about seafood, I invited a former fisherman and owner of a wild seafood company, Randy Hartnell. Randy spent more than 20 years as a commercial salmon fisherman in Alaska. In 2001, with his wife Carla, he founded Vital Choice Wild Seafood and Organics, a leading online seafood company. Randy is dedicated to helping people have access to high-quality, sustainable seafood while educating them about the impact of food choices on their health, the environment, and seafood resource. In this interview, we cover health benefits of consuming seafood, quality, purity, and contamination concerns, the safest fish to eat, the real difference between wild and farmed, and sustainable fishing practices. So please enjoy this interview. Randy, it's so great to have you on my show. It's a pleasure to be here, Trevor. Yeah, so Randy, you're a different kind of guest than I typically have. You have an interesting background as a commercial fisherman, right? Um, So I want to hear about what that was like and how that got you into what you're doing now. Uh, Well, that was a great lifestyle. It's been quite a while now. It's been about 15 years since I retired from fishing. I was more or less forced out of it. uh, uh, But I started way back in college, working my way through school and fell in love with the the lifestyle, uh, earning a living out in nature. It's, uh, it was something I really loved, did for over 20 years. And then about 15 years ago, industrial salmon started taking over world markets and basically pushed the wild salmon that we were catching, uh, out of the market. And, uh, so almost overnight, my, the prices collapsed, couldn't make a living at it anymore and needed to figure out something else to do. And, uh, but the, the real tragedy of it was that the fisheries were healthy. Uh, Alaska has a fantastic management system uh, that's been in place for over 50 years. And so we were catching lots of fish. They just weren't worth anything because nobody wanted them. Everybody wanted the cheaper, more plentiful farm salmon. And at that time, they really didn't know the difference uh, difference between the two, which can be really dramatic. Uh, so anyway, I... Had to come up with something to do, uh, essentially started Vital Choice as a solution for people who still wanted wild salmon but couldn't get it. And uh, so I uh, view the company now as uh, sort of a, uh, our, we serve our customers, we connect this incredible resource up in Alaska with people across the country who appreciate it 
and want it. And fortunately, more and more people are becoming informed about the differences between wild and farmed salmon. So our demand has been growing steadily uh, ever since we started. So and it's really a, a joy to be able to provide uh, our customers with great seafood, one of the healthiest, most sustainable foods on earth, and also at the same time support the people that are still uh, making a living fishing in Alaska. Great. And you mentioned, that's fantastic, and you mentioned that people are now more aware about the difference between wild and farm. What, what are some things that you saw made that shift happen? Uh, that's a great question. And that's really that educational component has been a big part of our mission at Vital Choice from the very beginning, because I came from the industry and I saw the devastation that uh, resulted as a result of the abandonment of, of wild salmon. Uh, and it's very similar to what has happened in uh, the cattle industry or, you know, all kinds of proteins where you had the big industrial feedlots uh, that have put the small independent farmers out of business to the detriment of the nutritional quality of, of the food, right? So uh, so we started out uh, basically telling our story to anybody who would listen. And I sort of figured out that if I could connect with the influencers, especially in the health and wellness community, who already had big audiences, then uh, you know, if I could educate them, then they could in turn educate their uh, communities, They're the people that read their books, that watch their PBS specials, so on and so forth. And so I made a, uh, that was my mission uh, initially to do that. And what was really uh, incredibly surprising and, and uh, beneficial was that when I would reach out to these people, people like Dr. Andrew Weil and, and Dr. Christian Northrup and Dr. Uh, Nicholas Paracone, they were really uh, receptive to the information. They wanted to hear it. Uh, they started putting us in their books and, and that just became a, a sort of a, a, a campaign by which we, uh, we educated a lot of people through them, not only us, but, but, uh, that was, I, th- I don't think anybody else was reaching out to those particular types of folks the way that we were. And so consequently millions of people, uh, sort of got the story. And now most of those people, most of the health influencers do understand it. And so whenever they have an opportunity, whenever anybody asks them, you know, about the differences, uh, they're able to, to pass that information on. Mm-hmm. And you, you mentioned Dr. Paracon as one of the people. And so he is a dermatologist and this was, when, when was it? He, he, he actually, um, to, uh, tell the story about how you connected with him and, and how that went for you. Sure. Yeah, I was still a fisherman back then. In fact, I was fishing a a herring fishery in San Francisco. And uh, it was one of those life experiences that started out like the worst possible thing that could happen that actually turned into the best possible thing that could happen. Uh, We hadn't been made much money back during that period. And so I was down there trying to, uh, to catch some fish and my boat broke down, my engine blew up. And uh, I went into the dock and uh, we started the process of rebuilding my engine. And, and I had this little TV on the boat that I would leave on just basically for noise in the background. And it was on the PBS channel. And Dr. Paracone was doing one of his, uh, his uh, programs on PBS, uh, promoting a book that he was, uh, that was very popular at the time. I think it hit number one on the health and wellness charts uh, called The Wrinkle Cure. And I remember thinking, wow, what is PBS doing promoting a book called The Wrinkle Cure? But as I listened to it, uh, I realized that he was talking about wild salmon being the ultimate skin food, (laughs) the ultimate wrinkle cure, you know, because of all the healthy fats and the other micronutrients that are in not only salmon, but other seafood. And I thought to myself, wow, because I was thinking about starting Vital Choice at the time, so I was thinking, well, he's telling his national audience to eat salmon and and particularly wild salmon, but 99% of them have no idea where to get it because it's been displaced by the farm salmon. So I wrote him a letter. My wife and I sat down, spent a couple days, wrote him a letter, and uh, he responded. And uh, make a long story short, we flew out to Massachusetts where his, or Connecticut, where his office is and met with him, told our story, and he said, well, you, you know, what you're uh, suggesting would be a great resource for my 
readers and my audience. So we will uh, we'll put you in our next book. And he did. And and sort of the rest is history, so to speak. Uh, that book came what, out. What book was that and when was it? That was called The Paracone Prescription. And that came out, I think, in uh, August of 2002. Okay. And so we met with him about six months before them, and he then and he told us we had six months to, to basically get our company together. So we had to build a website and packaging and just all of that stuff that uh, I really didn't know how to do. So it was a it was an exhilarating six months, but but it all fell into place, and uh, you know, he's been sending us customers ever ever since. That's great. That's great. very grateful for it as well. And, so you mentioned um, how what he talked about in his book. And for those people who aren't familiar with his book and when he talks about the, the nutrients in fish, what is your awareness of, of the nutrients in fish that are particularly good for, for our skin? Well, of course, the first and foremost are omega-3 fatty acids and particularly the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. And there's some others in there, DPA. But, uh, you know, these are marine fats that are not found in the terrestrial food supply. And, you know, life evolved in the ocean and amid a, a background of these marine fats, which originated algae, one of the earliest life forms. And so if you look at the primary biological components of, of our bodies, basically our cell, our eyes, our brains, our reproductive systems, those are all those all contain concentrations of these these long chain omega three fatty acids and our skin, of course, and uh, and what's happened with our industrial food supply is they've have, they've pretty much been displaced almost completely. Uh, the last uh, and you I'm sure know this. The last uh, uh, statistics I saw was over ninety percent, probably closer to ninety five percent of people eating an American diet are terribly deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. And because they're important to every cell in the body, brain, eyes, they manifest, a deficiency will manifest itself in, in a lot of ways. And the most common way to tell if somebody's deficient in omega-3 fatty acids is uh, our skin problems, dry skin, eczema, psoriasis. You you know more about this than I do, I'm sure. Uh, but... Uh, uh, so that's, uh, and then, then of course, as I said, there are a lot of other micronutrients found in, in seafood, uh, that also are beneficial. Right. Great. So, um, I get, there are a lot of questions that people have about the purity of fish and the concerns about contamination. And, um, I got a, a, a question recently posted to me um, from Patricia, and she asked about the. Um, she asked, "Are salmon actually safe to eat that are wild caught?" Because she she said, "My understanding is that salmon is high in mercury." And so I wanted to, and also she she mentioned other contaminants in the ocean. Can you talk about that and and the purity issues, contamination? I would be happy to talk about that. We talk about that a lot. And, uh, you know, we named our company Vital Choice for uh, quite a few different reasons. And one that, as we mentioned earlier, it's, these are vital nutrients that you only get in the marine food supply or, you know, supplements occasionally. Uh, but uh, also because of my uh, experience in the industry, I, you know, I know seafood very well. Now, as far as contaminants go, what we've learned you know, over 15 years of doing this, we test fish. We know that our customers are concerned about this. And we, you know, myself, my wife, children, all of our employees and their children, we eat more of our seafood than anybody. So obviously we don't want to eat anything that's dangerous or harmful. And, and it's really, you know, when you look into this, there's just so much stuff out there on the internet sort of fear mongering about about uh, contaminants in seafood but if you really look at the science the evidence is overwhelming that the benefits of eating seafood outweigh the risks and particularly certain types of seafood now you don't want to go out and eat a big top of the food chain predator predator like a 
you know, a shark or a large, you know, billfish. Uh, you don't want to eat stuff, you know, anything that's at the, toward the top of the food chain because those trace levels of mercury that are in, you know, that are pretty much in everything. The whole, the whole problem is, uh, or issue is the dose. You know, it's like if you drink too much water, that could be lethal. If, but uh, it's pretty apparent that, you know, my, minuscule trace levels of mercury in seafood are not harmful. The biggest, most elegant studies that have been done uh, have all concluded the same thing, that the benefits vastly outweigh the risks. Now, uh, so what we do is we source fish that are known to have shorter lives. A salmon only lives two to four or five years. So they're not out there bioaccumulating large levels of mercury. They eat toward the bottom of the food chain, in particular pink salmon, sockeye salmon. They eat predominantly krill, plankton, you know, toward the bottom of the food chain. And so they're well, actually one of the cleanest fish. So I'm not sure where Patricia got her information, but uh, I can assure her that we've done a lot of testing over the years, and, and salmon are actually one of the cleanest fish in the ocean for those reasons. They eat at the bottom of the food chain, and they're relatively short-lived. And also, uh, Alaska is one of the most pristine areas on Earth. If you've ever been there, it's uh, it's pretty magnificent. Yeah, absolutely. It produces a lot, of, a lot of really great seafood. So... Salmon, um, salmon's one of your, one of your, the main fish that you carry, but you have other seafood as well. We have lots of other kinds of seafood and it's all great. You know, we just <laughs> like, like to provide a variety and, you know, we'll get requests for things that we don't have and we'll look at them if we can find number one, uh, you know, a clean, pure source and number two, a sustainable source. That's another foundation of our, uh, uh company that we will only source sustainably harvested fish. And basically that means that the fishery fish are coming from a fishery that is managed on a science, you know, on a biological level. In other words, it's not driven by market demand. It's driven by the, uh, the scientists that are in charge of making sure that no more fish are taken than, than that run can sustain. Alaska is really a model for the world on fisheries management. They wrote right into their uh, into their uh, state constitution when they became a state that all of their fisheries resources would be managed on a sustainable basis. So you have biologists that are in charge of every river that produces salmon, and those biologists are the one that say, that dictate you know when you can go fishing, when you can not go fishing. And they want to ensure that every river gets the number of fish it needs. So it's really a great story. The more you, I don't have time to go into much of it today, but the more you learn about seafood uh, from Alaska, the really the better it looks. And that's, and that's fascinating. I didn't know that, but that really ties into the, the questions that I get also about environmental issues with fish, mm-hmm. because I know that there are some people that don't want to eat fish because um, they're concerned that they're they're not sustainable. That it's we're damaging the environment. We're we're you know killing off populations of fish, and that they're not we're not we're going to lose salmon at some point. I've actually heard that from people like what we're not going to have wild salmon anymore if we keep fishing the way that we fish. Um, so and and the reason why I have you on is wild salmon is one of my favorite foods to recommend to people. And so sometimes I get questions on it and I get these questions of purity of environmental issues. And so I think it's really important for us to talk about these things so that people can, can feel comfortable eating this amazing food. Um, so, so is there anything else you want to as- oh, yeah, I, I, I'm, it is a, truly an amazing food and not just for humans. I, I've seen estimates of up to 130 different species rely on wild salmon. And it's not like, you know, we're, we're catching them all and taking them away from the other species. Uh, as I said, salmon, uh, say, let's look at sockeye salmon, which is our sort of signature product. Sockeye salmon only live four years. They're born in the rivers. They migrate out into the ocean where there's lots of food and they, they grow. And then at four years on average, they return back to that same exact spot that they were born. Well, uh, what happens depending on the ocean conditions, climate, food, all of that, uh, you may get 10 times, 20 times more fish returning to that particular river than, than those spawning habitats can actually uh, accommodate. 
for instance, the river that I used to fish in, uh, would a, the optimum number of spawners was about 2 million. And so as those biologists I referred to earlier would count. They're, they've got all different ways of counting these fish coming back into the river. And once they were assured that they were going to get their 2 million, everything else is what they call a harvestable surplus. And uh, one year we had 20 million fish re- returned to that river. And it was a, you know, it was a bonanza in 1995. But, uh, but the thing about it is think of another protein, another food, animal food that is allowed to live 95% of its life as nature intended. Those salmon are not going to live longer than four years. And when they get back to that river, uh, their days are numbered. And so the harvestable surplus is taken there, and then that becomes food for humans. And a lot of the ones that go up the river become food for birds and, you know, everything from bacteria on up to, you know, bears and, you know, big predators. So, uh, and people really are surprised to hear that. You know, it's not like that they're being, uh, as opposed to other types of animal foods where, you know, they're only raised for a short time and then, and then, uh, taken to market. So can you, can you spend a moment explaining the difference between what you just described as a wild salmon mm-hmm. and what a lot of people are eating and is what's available in most restaurants and grocery stores, right? Or farm salmon, even though there has been a shift, like you mentioned, that most of the salmon that we see out there is farmed. So can you explain what that process is like? Well, the simplest analogy is a comparison between factory farm say beef, pork, chicken, whatever, and the free range pastured beef, or even a better analogy would be a game, wild game. Uh, The wild versions, whether it's fish or game, are out consuming what nature intended for them to consume. They're basically the same thing that humans have all eaten over the millennia. And, you know, people, humans have been eating seafood. It's been documented for over 160,000 years. <laughs> We've been practicing agriculture for about 10,000. So when you eat wild seafood, you're basically eating what we were programmed to eat, and our body recognizes it as a natural food. Uh, farmed animals, farmed salmon, all the other things I mentioned, uh, are in this day and age in our country are essentially fed grain. Uh, cows are herb of herbivores. You know they're not supposed to eat uh, seed, seed products, grain, corn. Uh, same with pretty much everything else. But because in this country we subsidize grains, they're very cheap. They're very plentiful, and so uh, even the salmon, the farm salmon, are being fed more and more of these grains. Uh, I think we can all agree that salmon did not evolve to eat grain products. <laughs> and the big uh, difference there is these grains are full of uh, linoleic acid or omega-6 fatty acids. And that's kind of another subject. But as you know, omega-6 is in excess, tend to be uh, highly pro-inflammatory. And so whether we're eating you know, uh, factory farm chicken or pork or beef, we're basically eating corn byproducts or corn, lots of omega-6s. And the same thing with farm salmon. Uh, wild, wild sockeye salmon has roughly nine times more omega-3s of these, these uh, essential long-chain omega-3s than omega-6s. Nine times more omega-3s than omega-6s. Whereas a farm salmon, because it's being fed a lot of grain, uh, has about equal amounts omega threes and omega sixes, so it doesn't do nearly as good a job of increasing your omega three status as as wild fish will, and that, that goes for any farm uh, fish, catfish, farm tilapia. We eat a tremendous amount of tilapia in this country, and there's almost you know there's, there's very little uh, nutritional uh, value to that compared to a wild alternative. Yeah, and so with with the fish that are grown um, farm raised they're they're fed grain but what about the environment can you speak to that too yeah, the environment just, in which they're raised sorry. yeah that's just the one you know the, the nutritional impact and of course there's the fact that uh, you know they're raised in pens in the open marine environment so there's tremendous pollution pollution problem they impact other species with disease parasites uh, waste, you know, which is, uh, 
Farm salmon is cheap because the the environment is subsidizing all the waste. We all know what the the, the factory farms look like and the tremendous waste problems that they have. Well, the fish farmers just let Mother Nature uh, take care of the waste. And uh, here in British Columbia, uh, we've got many fish farms out here off the coast set right along the migration routes where the wild salmon, the little wild salmon smolt that are coming down out of the rivers, they have to pass through those waters and they're picking up uh, parasites, lice, diseases, uh, uh, just there's just a lot of problems. We can talk all day about the problems with farm salmon, and I would just suggest to your readers if they are interested in learning more about this, you can just Google farm salmon and read lots of stuff about it. And uh, there's one particular website called farmedanddangerous.org that goes into all the details of all the different problems with farm salmon. And uh, I might mention that just this morning. Uh, we got a, uh, I saw a notice in my inbox that Canada just approved genetically modified salmon. And to my knowledge, that's the first place in the world it's actually been approved. We're, they're still uh, fighting it here in, in the U.S. But uh, so what that's, does, that's a whole other can. Well, you know. can you briefly explain why that's a concern? Uh, genetically modified, well, it's the first genetically modified animal being sold as food, as I understand it. Uh, so there's, you know, the... A lot of big questions there. And uh, what they've actually done is they've taken a gene out of a, one type of fish and put it into a salmon so that the, gra the salmon grows like many times faster than it normally would. It's called an antifreeze gene. Uh, so it doesn't waste a lot of energy maintaining. Uh, well, I won't go into the details here. Again, you can find out more about that. But well, And I think that's really interesting. So if it's, if it's growing bigger than it's supposed to, that nature intended to, I wonder what that's doing to its nutritional content. That's the big question. Yeah. And, and, then, right? and then also, what when we eat foods that are genetically modified, what's that doing to our genes? How is that going to modify our genes? So those I are some of the questions. I don't think anybody can answer that, and that's the problem. Now, they say in this article that they've had two studies uh, that have basically determined that uh, these are safe for humans to eat. But, of course, the genetic – I mean, the GM debate has uh, been raging now for many years, and uh, – well, we won't really know what but, uh, the, the impact important is takeaway. for several generations. We won't know what the impact The important really takeaway is. here is just as with uh, all GM foods, if you want to avoid them, you know, we've been trying to pass labeling laws, which are being defeated at every turn, at least so far. But the way to ensure that you're not getting genetically modified food is to uh, source organic foods. The way to ensure you're not getting genetically modified salmon is to source wild salmon. And, okay. uh, and that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of far, uh, fraud in the marketplace. A lot of farm salmon is labeled as wild because more and more people are asking for it. And most people don't know how to tell the difference. And, uh, really, so it becomes critical that you, you know, your fishmonger and you buy a uh, product from stores or people that you can trust. Yeah. So uh, is there a way to know the difference? So what, if you looked, would you be able to tell by looking at a piece of fish if it was farm versus wild? Uh, I personally could tell 95% of the time. It depends on the species. Farm salmon is is typically much lighter, pale, uh, much more pale orange, and it has large white lines, uh, fat lines in it. And uh, and then the wild salmon, and especially sockeye salmon, is is dark orange, bright. It's it's called its nickname is red salmon because the flesh is this brilliant. Uh, red orange color and almost you just can't hardly see any fat in it you know it's an ocean roaming athlete versus the farm salmon which is you know swimming around circles in a pen its entire life and so it's a very you know a lot more fat and uh, uh so that's one difference uh typically a, a store that is going to offer wild salmon you know they're paying more they're going to trouble to get that wild salmon and and they will know where it comes from. And oftentimes the people that are being disingenuous will be, uh, you know, not really know, be able to answer direct questions about, oh, that, if they're saying it's wild salmon, they should be able to tell you exactly where it came from. If they, if they uh, waffle at all, that's usually a big yellow flag. 
Um, I've, I've I was had, in I was with restaurant. Dr. Wild in New York. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I, had a, I was at a restaurant once, and a and I asked where they said that oh, we yeah we have wild salmon. I said where did it come from, and they said Scotland. And I thought, <laughs> um, are you sure it's wild? <laughs> Because no, I, I if it's it wild, all. it's got to come from where? So tell Randy, tell us where it's got to be coming from. If it's really truly wild, nine times out of ten, it would be Alaska, possibly British Columbia, but really almost all of it comes from Alaska. They have the biggest, healthiest runs. They're, in the last few years, they've had record salmon runs. I mean, historic levels of salmon runs. And a part of it, you know, big part of it is management. Another big part of it is habitat. The lower 48 here, we dammed our rivers and, you know, had industry and logging and civilization. And so salmon have not done well in the lower 48, but Alaska has got 34,000 miles of coastline. It's got thousands of rivers and pretty much every one of them has a salmon run. So most of the salmon, wild salmon you will see in the market is from Alaska. Now, right now, uh, here we are uh, coming into summer and uh, the salmon are just now starting to go back up in the rivers. And uh, this, this week in particular, the Copper River King Salmon is uh, the first fresh wild salmon of the year in Alaska. So there's a lot of uh, excitement about that. And uh, um, so anyway. That's great. Well, Randy, I feel like I could... I feel like I could talk to you forever about fish. And sometimes I know I've seen you at conferences before and I've you know, talked to you a lot about this. So I'm excited that we're able to, to share this with, with my audience. And I know that people will probably have more questions. So I'd love to be able to pass them along to you and maybe get back to people if that's okay with you. Um, so people could maybe post some comments below the video on YouTube and my website. I'll pass them along to you and then we can try and get people's questions answered because I know people have a lot of questions about the quality of fish and where to get it. And so is that, does that sound good? Oh, that's absolutely. We're passionate about education every bit as much as we are about, you know, making the fish available. So uh, happy to do that. And I would invite your best guests to visit our website, vitalchoice.com, where we have a, a huge, uh, you know, archive of information. We've got a search box on there so you can ask your questions. Uh, we've got a great science-based newsletter that comes out every week, and uh, that's a great source of information. Over a thousand issues in our archive. So the website is a rich resource, and you can also just call us out because we've got great customer service people that love to answer questions. And I'll, I'll be happy to handle them as well. Yeah, and your and your fish is delicious. I love getting orders from you, and um, food really the fish really is amazing. So thank you so much for everything you're doing to provide us with fresh, healthy fish. <laughs> thank you, Trevor. Thanks for helping us get the word out. Appreciate it. All right, Bye -bye. thanks, Randy. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Randy Hartnell. To learn more about Randy and Vital Choice Seafood, visit my website, thespadoctor.com. Go to the podcast page with his interview, and you'll see all the information and links there. And if you have any questions, you can post them below the video there or on YouTube. Also, I invite you to join the Spot Doctor community on my website or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend that you get your customized skin profile at theskinquiz.com. It's free and only takes a minute to answer questions to get great tips for glowing skin and vibrant health. Theskinquiz.com for your own customized skin report. Also, don't miss out on the latest tips for glowing skin and vibrant health. Be sure to follow me on Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, and Twitter and join the conversation. You can also post your questions there. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.